There you go. I should record the meet the the class meeting. I'm gonna record. Oh, I forgot to push that. But I'm gonna record class meetings, uh, just in case we're gonna need to look for a backup uh, stuff, stuff. Okay. All right. Um, there are also. Um, I probably see more than you guys do, but there's also breakout rooms where I can sort of pick people to work in groups. Um, so we'll kind of not get too fancy at the beginning, see what we can do, and then go from there. All right, so before we get started with kind of looking at math, um, do you guys have any questions so far? So unmute yourself, you can, you can speak up or, or you can type in the chat box. Hey, Professor. Hi. Uh, I don't know if you mean like questions in general or not, but uh, I had a question about one of the quiz problems. Uh, I don't know if you want to do that now or if I should just email you personally afterwards. No, I, I do want to go over some quiz questions um, like during the session. I think that would be a productive thing for me to do. Okay, so uh, my only my only problem so far was um, so let me just pull it up. So in, uh, in quiz six, uh, I believe it was problem three. I, I, I wasn't sure about my setup and mm -hmm. it seems like everyone had like a different setup for it. So I'm really not sure what the correct way to set it up was. Okay. All right. So I'll, I'll I'll save that. I, I want to kind of go over some things first and then we'll, we'll go over uh, problem three. Um, I had uh, other students email me about that one, so that's a good one to go over. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Anyone else um, have any questions about any, anything, course or problems? Uh, yes, Professor. Hi. Hi, Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. I had a question for the quiz, um, I'm sorry, test two. Yes. When would that be administered? Um, so I, I sent an email it's in the announcements. I'm going to, so you're going to get the test file in Canvas, okay? And I'm gonna open it up. I forgot when I said for your class, but sometime on Thursday. Uh, and you guys will have 24 hours to complete it. Oh, yes. Okay. Right. So, uh, Thank you. So, and then you're going to submit it uh, in the assignment in Canvas. So, so okay. you basically don't have to print out the test paper. You can just sort of do the problems on a piece of paper, take a photo and upload them, or you can type your answers however you want to kind of do your work. But you'll have 24 hours uh, to complete the test. Okay. okay, thank you, Professor. All right. Okay, other questions? All right, so what pending assignment, upcoming assignments do we have? <clears throat> All right, so I think what to do for this class, let's see, I have quiz six. I made it due Wednesday night. Okay. Um, and again, sort of in the announcement for the course, I think I listed uh, when the due dates were. Okay, so um, investigations <coughs> four and five are due tonight. Okay. And those you can, if you haven't submitted them already, some people submitted them on paper before you know, everything happened. Uh, if you haven't submitted them already, again, you can sort of um, type them up or, or, or take a picture and, and upload them to, to Canvas. Um, and yeah, thanks, Siki. you're, you're my, <laughs> everything is great. Uh, and yeah, I, and I postponed it, um, I postponed uh, project one um, so far. I'm trying to kind of figure out what to do with the projects. Um, my gut feeling for the project, because we have two for the class, is to just cut it down to one project and make it individual so we won't be in any change in points. 
but I'll we'll just sort of do one part of it and we'll sort of have it individual. So you'll sort of do about the same amount of work, but we won't I won't get you guys to overwhelm the stuff. Um, there was a question whether for the investigation can we submit them individually? Um, yes, you, you can do that or if you can communicate with sort of your partner, if you remember who you work with, then you can get, um, just make sure like one of you submits it and in the message box put, um, I work, I work with such and such and then I can get, give everybody credit, okay? All right, perfect. All right, cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let me go to Canvas and sort of show you where, where I've been putting things, All right? So I'm gonna share my screen, All right, and you should be seeing our course, okay, the Canvas course. Okay, um, so um, as we're working through the course, uh, Canvas is really important. So this is the student view. Okay, so um, check the announcements. I'll try to put things in the announcements and also send you emails. But I know from personal experience that I get so many emails that they get lost. So if you have kind of questions about deadlines and stuff, announcements are really good. So here's the this I sent last Friday. Okay. Um, so you can see that sort of what I'm asking you to this to do this week. Okay. Uh, so I asked you to if you can take this technology survey that will give me an idea. If there's anybody in the class who doesn't have access to technology, of course, if you don't, you're probably not here. But okay, let's <laughs> let's see. Um, and I asked you to watch and take notes on sec the section two point seven lecture, which I pre-recorded. Okay, so. Now today we're meeting, and then I'm going to the hours right after class, all right, via Zoom. Okay. Um, now before next class, I think before Wednesday, watch and take notes on the Section 3.8 lecture, and on Wednesday we'll meet live. I have office hours. I'm going to submit Facebook and. Uh, Submit the title for credit if you're doing it. Okay. And then on Thursday, I'm going to make test two available in Canvas at noon, and it will be due back in Canvas on noon the next day. So that's 24 hours, like I said. All right. Let me just. Okay. Let's see question. How well this? Uh, how will I know if we do you take the survey or not? This is not graded. It's just for me to kind of have information, sort of just know if there are students in the class who don't have technology. Um, and also at the end, there's a question that says, "How can I help you?" And that's important that you tell me if there's anything I can do to make this transition better. Um, okay. Um, so another thing, so do me a favor and if you're not speaking, mute because I'm still getting some feedback um, from um, people's mics. So just go, go to the bottom of your screen, bottom left of the Zoom screen and click the microphone unless you're speaking. All right, cool. All right, so let's that. So if we go to the module or the home screen. So yeah, here, the quizzes are here. So quiz six should be submitted by clicking on this button and then on submit. All right, writing assignments. I'm, I'm gonna grade number six soon. And that's still on my schedule. And investigation four and five are submitted here. And here the lecture material is over here. So we're in chapter three. Right. And if you scroll, the 
section 3.7. Hopefully you found it already. But I've, I've uploaded video lectures for the next few sections. 37, 38, 39, 41, and 42. They're all uploaded. And so I'm trying to kind of run a bit ahead of time. Uh, but yeah, if you go click on here, you should see links to YouTube videos. Right, so basically I did what I usually do in class, go over the lecture problems and explanations. I try to break up the videos um, like in 15, 20 minute segments so they're not too long. And at the bottom right here, I also posted like an image of um, my, the notes. Okay, so basically this is as I was writing um, the notes and taking the video, I save those files um, so you have access to them. Okay, so can all the lecture stuff is on there. Um, so my intent is my intent is that you guys pre watch the lectures and recover the notes, and then during class time, we can. I can answer questions on these lectures and we can work on problems, we can uh, extra examples or we can work on quiz problems. Okay. Um, so, um, so this is, I think it's more productive to, if I don't see you in person, it's probably more productive to, uh, to work on, on problems and me to answer questions. All right. Yeah, let me see if I can, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. So I can get to my, I'm going to mute a couple of people because of the feedback is kind of bad. All right, so there you go. I think I muted everyone. It's a lot quieter now. <laughs> but if you want to speak up, please unmute yourself and, and, and speak up. Okay. All right, perfect. Good. All right, um, I'm trying to figure this out myself too. Um, I can force mute people if I'm on this screen, but if I'm sharing my screen, I can't. I don't see how I can force mute. So, um, so we'll, we'll we'll figure out there. Okay, so um, let me look at um, one of the questions. So you all had a question on quiz six number three. So let's go over that first. And then we'll go over some induction stuff. All right. Um, so let's see if I can pull up, I'll share my screen again. And I'm going to share. Let's see. I think it's in this one. Uh, quiz six. There we go. Right, so here's quiz six. So this was the problem that we were we were talking about. Okay, so, so I'm gonna grab this problem right here. And I'm gonna paste it. I have a little I'm using Photoshop as a whiteboard. Okay. And let's see. There you go. So this problem says, determine the validity of the following argument, All right? So for students to do well in a discrete math course, it is necessary that they study hard. Students who do well in math in courses do not skip classes. Students who study hard do well in courses. Therefore, students who do well in the discrete math course do not skip classes. All right, so when I read through this, um, I see um, four propositions. All right. Hmm. Okay, let me see. Just give me a second. My computer seems to be running a bit slow. I think there's just too much going on for it. 
So I see, uh, let's see, this is way too small. Bigger. All right. Okay, so the P proposition, I'm going to say it's students do well in a discrete math course. Okay, um, and then um, let's say Q is the students study hard. And then um, students who do well in courses. See, I, this is a different prepositions than students that do well in a discrete math course. Okay, so even it's like doing well in courses, uh, those are two separate propositions. So I'm going to call R uh, to be um, students do well in courses. Okay, and then the last one. Is there another one? So students who are discrete math, it's necessary that they study hard, skip classes, okay? So, so we have uh, do not skip classes. So uh, let's do S is students skip classes. There we go. All right, let's see. All right, so to answer the chat, yes, I'm recording this lesson. Um, so I will upload it to YouTube and post it in Canvas later. Okay, so um, yes. All right, so now let's see what our uh, statement say. Okay, so the first sentence says, for students to do well in a discrete math course, it's necessary that they study hard, right? So that necessary, okay, um, it, it kind of, it gives you a conditional statement, okay? So that necessary makes the first statement uh, into P, therefore Q. P, therefore Q. Okay, so this is that version of the conditional statement with necessary, like Q is necessary for P, uh, that it means the same as if P then Q. So basically, if students do well in a discrete math course, then they study hard. Okay, so that's the translation um, for the first sentence, okay? Then the second sentence, students who do well in courses do not skip classes. All right, so students who do well in courses is R, do not skip classes is going to be not S. All right, um, let's see, next one. Um, students who study hard, so Q implies uh, do well in courses, R, okay? And we need to prove, therefore, oops, that's the wrong thing. Therefore, we need to prove that students who do well in the discrete math course, this implies uh, do not skip classes, implies not S. All right, so that's the translation that I see for this. Okay, okay. Anybody have any question on how I set this up, how I translated it? You're seeing the wrong link. Oh, okay, let me see. All right. Um, is this good? Oh, that's better. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. I didn't realize that. Uh, there you go. Okay, cool. I was talking and you guys were just seeing um, something else. We're seeing quiz six. Okay, I see. Um,
There we go. Okay, so if we are going to let you guys have a minute to look at uh, the statements. So P students do well in a discrete math course. Q is students study hard. R is students do well in courses. And S is students skip classes. So we have the first sentence I translated as if P then Q, because this is the necessary statement. Um, it's a conditional form like that. And then the others are conditional too. So these are our premises right here. And then we need to show that this is, this implies um, if P then not S. All right, any questions with, with how that's set up? Okay. Um, do you guys need me to go through the steps of the proof? Or is this enough to get people started? All right, so um, question was, is Q always what's necessary? Um, if the sentence was, is it necessary that they study hard for students to do well, it would be or it's necessary that they study hard. Well, the the part of the sentence that has necessary with it is the second one in the conditional. That's what comes after the arrow. Okay, so it's sort of if it was turn around, like you said, uh, it is necessary that they study hard for students to do well. Um, then the study hard will still come second. The, the, the one that comes second is the one that's associated with the word necessary. Um, so you could do, do a truth table for this, but I would rather you didn't because there's like four propositions. So that means you have 16 rows in the truth table and it's like messy. Um, I would rather you guys use the, the logic laws. Um, so the chain rules and the law of detachments and, and, and stuff like that. It, it makes it those laws, even though they might be a bit confusing at the beginning, it makes it a lot more practical to, to do proofs. Okay. Any other questions with this? All right. Okay, so I'm gonna sort of let it be where it is. Um, and uh, um, if you need more assistance with this, I can sort of work with you in office hours. Um, but um, let's see, are there any other questions on quiz six? Oh, professor? Yeah. So, sorry, I just want to, to make sure. So when we have something, these problems that say, like determine the validity of the argument, mm -hmm. uh, do we just do the same process essentially as a formal proof except we don't have to write down every single step because that's kind of how i was approaching it at first yeah you should you should still write down the steps um so the, yeah the the things whether they're valid or not uh you're basically for number two and number three on the quiz it's asking you that but basically uh, you're translating it to these um logical expressions but you should still be doing the kind of proofs that you're doing in number one uh, either a direct or an indirect one um, and show all the steps and give the reasoning okay thank you okay all right okay so um i got a request to look at 1a and 1b on the quiz so let me bring those up um, and then again, I can sort of um, get you started in the right direction. So let's see. So one A, one B. Let's grab this. Okay, so this is one A. And so this is asking us to give direct and indirect proofs for these, this, this sort of formal proof process. 
Oh, good. My stylus is finally working. It's great when technology fails right in the middle of things. All right, so, um, so these are sort of my premises over here, and I'm trying to get to that conclusion. All right, so let's look at what we can do. All right, so our goal is to um, combine the propositions in some way and get B by itself. Okay, so um, right away, I guess I can see that maybe I can use the, the third and the fourth proposition. So if I start with D, therefore, A or C, and D, so basically I'm putting the third and the fourth together, so this is given, right? Then this is going to give me A or C uh, by detachment, right? Because detachment, it's in the form if P then Q and P is given, therefore Q is concluded. All right, so, so this gives me that. Okay, so that, that might be helpful. All right, let's see. Um, so now, so I use this one, I use this one. Uh, now let's go, because this has C in it, I'm going to try to combine it with the second premise. So I'm going to change A or C into not A, therefore C, and this is the conditional equivalence. Right? All right, I think uh, the internet dropped me, but I seem to be back. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's see. Okay, let me see if we can sort of get. No, no. I, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, this morning I've been having the internet has been a little bit iffy. I don't know if it's just everybody's using Canvas at the same time or Zoom at the same time, but. Uh, well, just uh, work with it, right? Okay, so let me share my screen again. I'll share my desktop. There we go. Are we seeing? You seeing the the whiteboard again? Uh, let's see. Let me check. <laughs> yeah, I sort of. I think Zoom is going to have uh, some uh, interesting, challenging time for the next uh, few weeks, but uh, um, put some resources in there. Anyway, so let me continue. Um, so I said A or C turns into not A, therefore C with conditional equivalence. And now I'm going to combine this with the second premise like this. Okay, because now oh, I can use the chain rule. So this is going to turn into not A, therefore B. So this is chain rule. All right. Okay, so now sort of I have this and this that I could um, combine together. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm going to. Um, turn this around, okay, because I want to have A at the end here and A at the beginning there. So I'm going to say that this is not B, therefore A. So this is the contrapositive, right? Um, contrapositive switches them around and negates both of them, right? And then I can see that I can do not B, therefore A, and with the first premise, okay, and this is chain rule again. So this is says not B, therefore B. Okay, so this is chain rule. All right. Okay, so again, my goal was to kind of get B by itself. All right, so now I have this sort of weird conditional here. 
but I'm going to change it into an or statement. So or statement, this is B or B. This is the conditional equivalence again. And um, B or B implies B. And this is like the independent, in them potent law. It says that if you have B or B, you have to have B. So, so here we go. Um, I got to, to my conclusion. Okay. So, Sean, did you raise your hand? Do you have a question? Yes, I did. Good morning. Uh, just wondering if you could write this out and see if I got to this conclusion, if this is like a, a legal move here. Um, but, okay, on. let's see. It's uh, could you write out B or not A or C? B or not A or C or C. And the the not outside of the parentheses of A. Oh, or C. Right, okay, okay. And then that is a after that it's and A or C. All right, let me just see. And A, a or C. C? Yep. And then disjunctive uh, simplification, would that give me B or is that a legal thing to do? This would give you, all right, so is this? That right there. That gives you B. Okay, thank you. It does, yeah, because this is the disjunctive simplification, that's correct. Okay, so again, sort of these proofs, there's not just one way of doing them. I sort of, I basically went stream of consciousness until I kind of stumbled on something. Uh, basically kind of my goal is like, try to use the premises. You don't have to just use them only once. You can like reuse them sometimes, but I kind of, I kind of go, I use this one, I use that one um, to sort of get me somewhere. And my goal is like to get my conclusion in there, to sort of get bees in there. Any questions on this one? So this was the direct proof. I also asked you to do indirect proof, okay, where, where you, you negate the conclusion and uh, try to come up with some sort of contradiction, All right? Um, but again, sort of, I maybe leave this to office hours um, so we don't sort of run out of uh, time. Okay, Yuval, can you? Yeah, I just had a quick question about um, in the indirect proofs because when I was doing this, uh, what I usually did was I I just started with a negated conclusion and then worked my way from there. But yeah. I was also wondering, is it is it wrong to um, like it, would it be wrong to also do the exact same steps and then you would have like a B and not B, which is obviously a contradiction. Yeah, or is right. that incorrect? So the indirect proof, if you kind of, I guess I don't want to call it cheating, but, but if you sort of, <laughs> it, basically the indirect proof, you kind of, you could do exactly the same, same steps as, as this. And at the very end, you're going, well, I have B and not B, which is a contradiction. Right? So because in the indirect proof, you're going to put that on as part of the premises and negate it so it becomes one of your premises. So absolutely in direct proof, exactly the same step. And at the end you say this is a contradiction and it can be done. Um, the purpose for the indirect proof is not to follow the same steps because uh, for often for a direct proof, it's messy and it's sometimes not doable at all. Um, so the indirect proof, um, kind of the proper way to do it is to kind of start like backwards uh, or to start with that negation and try to connect it with things to get a contradiction, maybe like in less steps. Um, but uh, for the purpose of this class, uh, absolutely you can do this and just do this extra step at the end. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure that that's valid. Yeah, that's valid. All right. Okay, so let's go to uh, talk about section 3.7 a little bit, okay? Um, so again, sort of um, 3.7 is proof by induction. Um, and I asked you guys to pre-watch this and look at the notes. 
So I'm not doing like a full lecture on this because uh, there isn't time. I, as I said, I would rather spend time to answer your questions uh, that you have on quizzes. And if you took notes over while you're watching the lectures, I can clarify some things. All right, so let's see. Okay, so yeah, that's section 3.7 is the last section that will be on the test too, All right? Um, after that, uh, that's going to be part of the next test. So this is the last section that will be on test two. Um, so proof by induction is one of the proof methods um, that's very useful in math. Right, um, and um, we can use proof by induction in um, several different kinds of proofs. Uh, the first type is to prove theorems that are really formulas, okay? So there might be some formulas that you're already familiar with from algebra or calculus or things like that, um, but proving formulas is uh, one of the uh, main areas where proof by induction comes in, right? So let me pull up a problem that you guys could uh, work on. Um, see if you kind of, it's, if it's fairly clear in your mind uh, what this method is like. Um, so I'm gonna put one up and give you guys a few minutes to, to attempt it and then I'll go over it. Um, let's see. Here's one. Okay, so we want to show um, that if I add up Five plus eight plus eleven dot 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 plus three k plus two. So this is an arithmetic sequence that starts with five and increases by three each time. Uh, that this gives us one half three k squared plus seven k. And that's it. Okay. Um, so again, this is this is a summation formula. It comes from kind of the formula for the sum of arithmetic sequences that you might have seen somewhere in algebra. But we want to, as mathematicians, before kind of using formulas and saying these are valid, we like to prove them to kind of say, yep, this is actually valid for. Um, so let's say that we're looking um, actually. Let me change these to ends. I like my, my formulas to have ends in them. And let's look at n is bigger than or equal to zero. So non-negative integers. All right. So um, have a look at this problem, work on it for let's, let's say two or three minutes. Um, you can ask me questions over chat or microphone as we're working if you like, um, but I'll come back in a, about three or four minutes to go over it. All right, so let me uh, let me rewrite. So this is one half three n squared plus seven n. Okay. 
All right, so Suki, to answer your question, yes, exam two will be on those sections that you listed. So two five, which was the combinations with and permutation with repetitions. And then three one through three seven. Okay, so yeah, that's that's exam two. I figure out how to <laughs> figure out how to mute people from uh, sharing the screen. That's good. I have power. <laughs> All right. So let's look at this. Okay. So with induction, uh, the idea is that um, we look at the basis step. So the basis step is basically um, whatever the, the preposition at the lowest integer that you're trying to show it's valid for. Okay, so this here is my preposition. So P of N is this whole equality statement. Okay, so the basis step is um, P0 in this case. Okay, so P0 basically because I have N is bigger than or equal to zero, I'm trying to show that this is true for all non-negative integers, um, the basis is the value of the lowest value of n that you're interested in, right? So if I plug in a zero into both sides of the equality, so this side of the equality says I'm adding stuff up, right? Um, actually, does this work for n is zero? Because n is zero, I got it's um, the the sum is two. Maybe let's start it at one because um, it doesn't really make sense that it starts at zero, because if I plug zero in here, it's gonna start at two and not at five, okay? So I'm gonna start with n is one. Um, and when I plug in n is one into here, I get that this equals to five. So this means that this tells you the end value in your sum, so. If the end value of my sum is five, basically it only has one term. It's like five and nothing else, okay? And then on this other side, I'm going to plug in three times one squared plus seven times one. And this gives me 10 over two, which is five, okay? So the basis step is shown that it's true, right? Now the inductive step, So the inductive step says that I'm going to assume that P K is true. So K is a random integer 
that's bigger than one, right? So we're gonna assume that it's true for PK. So if I write PK, which is five plus eight plus 11, plus three K plus two, and that equals one half, three K squared plus seven K. So I'm just copying down the original formula with n replaced by k. All right, so we, we're we saying that this is true, okay? And we want to show that if pk is true, then we wanna show that the next one in line, that pk plus one is true. Okay, so we gotta show that this is true. Show this is true using this statement right here. So we're gonna write PK plus one. Okay, so we replacing N by K plus one in our original equation. So we have five plus eight plus plus eleven. And then three K plus two is what we ended with here. And you want to copy that down because it's gonna make it easier when we substitute. But then we wanna go one more. We want to plug in k plus one instead of n to get to the next term, All right? And then on the other side, this is gonna equal one half, three, and then n gets replaced by k plus one, and then seven, k plus one, like this. Okay, so using this PK statement is true, we wanna show that the PK plus one statement is true, right? So what we're gonna do now is a bit of substitution. So notice that this part is exactly the same as this part, okay? So because these are equal, this, gets plugged into here. So this formula replaces this part of the sum right here. So we're gonna write, rewrite the PK plus one statement. So we have one half three K squared plus seven K replaces this sum right here. But then we're going, we have also this that we need to write three K plus three plus two, three K plus five, okay? All right, so I rewrote the left-hand side of the PK plus one formula. So what I need to show right now is that what I wrote here is the same as what I want my formula to be, or my result to be if the pattern is followed. So we want to simplify this. All right, so we're going to, um, Find the common denominator. We have 3k squared and 7k, but this these need to be multiplied by two. So we have 6k and we have 10. All right? And then we have one half and 3k squared and 13k and 10. So are these equal to each other, All right? Let's see, we should really simplify this part too to see if it's the same. And so let me get some blue. So I'm gonna simplify this and this is one half three and this is K squared and two K makes six K and a three and then a seven K and a seven, All right? And you can see that these are gonna be the same because this is 13K and this is 10, like that, okay? So, um, so this shows that the PK plus one statement is true, okay? And that's the end of it. That's the end of the induction proof, okay? So you're done once you kind of show that this left side of the equation is equal to the right side of the equation for the PK plus one, then that completes the truth, uh, the proof. Um, so the idea behind induction is like, 
if you show that um, if the statement is true for one integer and that implies that it's true for the second in, for the next integer in line then that's going to be true for all integers because it kind of follows like a chain right because we just showed that p1 was true for the basis step and this implies that p2 is true and if p2 is true then that p3 is true and if p3 is true that p4 is true and it follows like a chain that all the uh, the statements for particular uh, integers are going to be true forever okay um so so that's it for here all right any questions with this problem Okay. Are we good at this one? All right. Okay. So let me go over an example now uh, of induction with inequalities. Okay. So let me see if I can find one. I think I probably need a new sheet of paper. So let me open up another sheet here. We go. All right, let's see if I can find that good inequality. All right, let's see. Okay, so I want to show that n factorial is bigger than e to the n for all positive integers bigger than or equal to seven. All right, so this is um, second type of problem that's really good with uh, induction proofs uh, showing that uh, inequalities hold. All right, so let's look at the basis step. Okay, so this right here is my proposition. This is my P of N proposition. So the basis step is P at the lowest value of N that we're given or that we're interested in. And in this case, it's seven, okay? And the reason seven is used and not one or two is because uh, this is not true for N is one or N is two. Uh, it doesn't, this doesn't become true until N is seven. Okay, so P7 is my starting point, right? So P at seven says, is seven factorial bigger than three to the seven? So seven factorial is, I don't have my calculator. Uh, let's see, 127, 20, it's a big number. Okay, let's see. This is seven factorial calculator. Seven, where's the factorial button? There it is, 50, 40. Okay, so 50, 40. All right, and three to the seven, it's also a big number, I'm sure. So three to the power seven. 2187. All right, so this is true. So that um, took care of the basis step. Okay, so now the inductive step. Okay, we basically write, write down two equations, two statements. So the first one is going to be PK. So we're looking at our proposition and we're replacing n by k. So this says k factorial is bigger than 3 to the k. And this is taken as a true statement, right? And we're going to write pk plus 1 statement 
So replacing n by k plus 1. So we have k plus 1 factorial bigger than 3 to the k plus 1. And this is to be proven. Right, so I don't know if this is true. So we want to use this statement as taken, taken as true and transform it into this one to show that it's true. Okay. So let's see. So with inequalities, you basically want to multiply both sides by the same thing or add both sides by the same thing in order to transform one side into of this into another. Um, so what I can, there's a couple ways to, to do it probably. But one, one way I can see it is if I multiply both sides by three. If I do this by three and this by three, because if I multiply by three, this is going to turn into three k plus one. Okay, so this is three times k factorial is bigger than three to the k plus one. All right, so I got to what I wanted on this side. So now we need to work on this side. All right. So what we want to show. So this is still a question. This is not given, it's sort of, we don't know this yet, but we want to show that this 3k factorial is actually less than k plus 1 factorial. All right. if, we, if we can show that this inequality right here holds true, then we can sort of cut out the middle and, and show that k plus 1 factorial is bigger than 3k plus 1. So with inequality, you are not substituting like we're doing with formulas. You, we're trying to kind of get this term right here to be less than uh, the thing that we want in our formula. Okay, so let's see if we can argue that this is true. So is 3k factorial less than k plus 1 factorial? All right. So if we look at properties of factorials, I know that k plus 1 factorial equals k factorial times k plus 1. All right? Um, because that's how factorials work, right? You sort of you multiply by the next integer, uh, right? If I have uh, 4 factorial is going to be 3 factorial times 4 because three is one times two times three, and if you multiply by four, then it becomes four factorial. So it's just by properties of factorials. All right, so now if we compare this, is k plus one bigger than three? Okay, and yes, k plus one is bigger than three because right here, we're told that this formula should work for n is bigger than seven, or k is bigger than seven, uh, because k is bigger than or equal to seven. So because I know from the beginning that my k has to be bigger than or equal to seven, then I know that k plus one has to be bigger than three, all right? So this inequality right here is true. k plus one factorial has to be bigger than three times k factorial. Okay. So if we sort of cut out this middle part, then, k plus 1 factorial is bigger than 3 to the k plus 1. And that's the end of it. Okay, so we showed, showed that inequality that we're trying to prove is true. All right, any questions on this problem? Okay, so this is one with induction that's used with inequalities. Okay. All right. Let me let's look at an induction problem with divisibility. Okay, so let's look at another example. Um, and I don't have one. Let's see. Let me just pull that pull, pull one from the lecture notes. I'll go over this one again. So let's look at example six. Okay. 
So this problem says that show that for all n is bigger than or equal to one, this expression is divisible by three. Okay, so again, this is my proposition that n cubed plus two n is divisible by three, right? So my basis step, and we're going to use the lowest value of n that we're interested in, one. And you plug one in, we get one cubed plus two times one, we get one plus two, which is three. So I go, yeah, three is divisible by three. Now for the inductive step, look at PK. And PK says K cubed plus two K is divisible by three. All right, so the way I can write that I can say that this expression here is going to be three times an integer. Let's say L. L is an integer. Okay. And this expresses mathematically that this expression divides by three exactly. All right. So this is taken as true. All right. And now what I need to show is that PK plus one is valid okay so pk plus one we look at our pn and we plug k plus one in there so wherever you see an n plug k plus one and we're going to see if that's divisible by three All right so we expand we have k cubed 3k squared 3k plus one 2k plus two all right, and let's see if somehow I can use this to substitute part of the formula. So I notice that I have k cubed and 2k. That appears there, right? So this is going to be substituted by 3L, right? And then what's left over is 3k squared and 3k. And then the one plus the two is a three. All right. Now this is looks good because everything has a three in front of it. So I'm going to factor out a three. Three k and then a one. Now that's not a that's that's just the k. All right. So this you can say this is divisible by three if you can convince yourself that this is an integer because divisible by three means your number can be expressed as three times an integer. So L is an integer, K is an integer, K squared is gonna be an integer, and one is an integer. So this is an integer right here, All right? So your, this expression can be written as three times some random integer, then it's divisible by three, so we're done. All right, any questions with the divisibility problem? Okay, all right, so you'll see in the lecture notes, induction is also useful for proving some things for um, sets and for propositions. Like I think there's might be an example on proving the generalized De Morgan's law. Um, so it's, um, occasionally you're going to see induction used in lots of different places. Um, but I want to go over strong induction before we run out of time. Um, so let's look at a strong induction um, argument. Let's see if I can find one. From here. No, let's, uh, let me just pull on from the lectures. This one, 11 is good. So prove that every amount of postage of 12 cents or more can be formed using four cent and five cent stamps. All right, so the difference with, uh, between the regular induction and strong induction is that um, 
you still have the basis step. You're still going to have uh, your initial P right here. Okay. Um, so let's look at, so the initial P right here, we're told that we want to look at postage of 12 cents or more. So my N is has to be bigger than or equal to 12. So N is basically how much money the postage is or the stamps are. So it's going to be bigger than or equal to 12. So my basic step is P at 12. And basically it's like, can I make 12 cents only using four cent and five cent stamps, not anything else? And I'm going, yeah, I can. I can have four and four and four. All right, so it's possible. All right, so the basic step works. And now the inductive step. Yep. All right, so for the inductive step for strong induction, you're not just assuming that PK is true, you're assuming that everything up to and including PK is true. So you're going to use everything that comes before your K plus one statement. So assume true. We're going to assume P at 12 is true and P13 is true and P14 is true all the way to PK. Okay, so all of these statements are assumed to be true. And we want to show that the PK plus one statement is true. All right. So we need to use not just the previous integer to prove that this is true. We might need to use all the ones that come before. All right. So the PK plus one statement says that a postage and amount of money of this many cents, so K plus one cents, can be written only using four and fives. So we don't need ones or twos or threes, just four and fives, okay? So basically the strong induction argument says that if I have K plus one cents, I can write it as two integers, the sum of two integers that are smaller than K plus one. So I'm gonna have two integers and both of these are smaller than K plus one. All right, because for example, if I have 27, I can write that as the sum of 15 and 12. That's sort of an example. There's other ways, all right? But the point is that both L and M are smaller than K plus one. So they fall into this part of these propositions. So from here, I know that PL can be written as the sum of fours and fives and PM can be written as the sum of fours and fives, right? And if each of these, like L and M, can be written as the sum of fours and fives, and so PL, this says L can be written, and PM says M can be written, All right? So if both L and M are just the sum of fours and fives, then if I combine them together, this is also the sum of fours and fives. Okay. Um, and this is my K plus one postage. So that completes the proof there. Okay, so that's strong induction where you're using all the previous statement to be taken as true. Okay, so strong induction, you'll notice there's a lot more writing words rather than equations. And for regular induction, there's a lot of substitution. But for strong induction, it's more like, can I make this number as a sum or a product of something that's smaller than it? And if you do, those uh, statements are assumed to be true. So that's kind of a general argument there. All right. Okay. Any questions on this one? Let's see. Okay, so there's a question, how did we know the K plus one equals L plus M? Okay, 
this. So, um, so again, sort of in this problem with the postage, so k plus one represents a number, an integer, okay? And basically what we're sort of saying in this line is that I can write an integer as the sum of two integers that are smaller than it, okay? So that's, that's all that says. So I can take any number like 27 and write it as the sum of two smaller integers like 12 and 15 or 11 and 16. Uh, all it matters here is that these two integers are smaller than this one. Any other questions with this one or other problems from strong from induction? All right. So, how about any questions from that you guys came across from lecture or from quiz six? We have about ten minutes left in class. Um, and I want to open it up to if you guys have uh, any particular questions with anything that you've been working on. All right, how about um, let's look at There you go. <laughs> Drop me again. All right, let's see. Okay, so let's look at quiz six. See if I can find any good problems. Um, how about, all right, how about 15? So problem 15 on the quiz, it's an induction problem. It's one of those divisibility ones, okay? Um, so um, let's get you guys to kind of try this out. So, so try it out with induction and then we can check in with each other. Um, oh, so yeah, what I want to try uh, is to see if you guys can share your work over Zoom uh, so everybody can see it. Um, so um, if you're working on this on a piece of paper, um, I've, you could take a picture of it with your phone and then um, you can sort of upload, if you mail it to yourself, then you can upload the file in chat. Um, or if you are typing, typing it on your computer, kind of the solution, you can upload the, the file through chat, through the chat feature. So if, uh, if you're working on it and you want to try that out, then we can see if we can sort of share work with each other and that might be, uh, that might be useful. Okay, well look at this and work on it for a few minutes um, and then we can uh, check it.
Okay, let me go over kind of at least the start of this one. I don't want to do it fully because it's a close problem, uh, but sort of give you an idea of how to start. Um, okay, so we have the basis step is kind of the first one that makes sense. So I think P of one, that's because it's not specified. So this is eight to the one minus three to the one is five and go, yep, that's divisible by five. Okay, does that make sense? Right. Now the inductive, we're gonna write PK. So that's eight K minus three to the K. And because that's divisible by five, we're gonna write it as five L, where L is an integer. All right, and with that, we need to prove PK plus one. So PK plus one is gonna be eight K plus one minus three K plus one. So we need to figure out if this is divisible by five. So we want to end up with, can I write this as five times an integer? Right, that's the question. All right, so a good method for this is substitution, just like we've sort of done a lot with uh, the other inductive things. So here you can solve for eight to the K. So that's gonna be five L plus three K and then plug it into here, right? So we want to say, well, we can break this up as eight times eight to the K minus three K plus one. And we wanna replace this part by this part and do some algebra and rearrange it to show that I'm gonna end up with something that's gonna be five times some parentheses of things that are integers. So that's a good strategy here. Oh, okay, so that's sort of, we're coming on to 11 o'clock. So that's the end of the, the Zoom session, the class time. Um, so ask, you can ask me any other questions, but I'm gonna keep the Zoom session on uh, because we're sort of, I have office hours after this. So if you wanna hang around and, um, and ask any more questions or uh, have any concerns, just let me know, okay? Um, again, I'll be available by email and I'll try to kind of post things that are coming up, due dates, check announcements, uh, especially because the, those are just better organized in the announcements in, in Canvas. Emails just get lost. All right, so bye guys. It was really nice to see you and uh, we can do this. <laughs> so uh, uh, keep working and have a great day. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
right, here I am typing when I can very well talk. <laughs> so question was, <laughs> will the test be much harder than the previous test? Um, so um, no, that's not my intent because my intent is not to, to make you guys uh, stumble over the questions. Uh, it will be open notes, so you can access your notes. Um, but I'm not, my intent is not to make the questions a lot harder, maybe a little bit more challenging than I would give in an in-class test, but, but not really like going too crazy. Okay. I can see that sort of the, the level of the questions that I give you on the quizzes, um, you guys, you find challenging enough. So, so I'm not going to make test questions like harder than what I put on the quizzes, for example. Um, let's see, Andy. Yes, I'm recording the session. Um, so I will I'll try to post this to YouTube and give the link in Canvas uh, in a couple of hours. It depends how long it takes to put a recording of this size on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, I, I will post the link to the recording. Uh, Mike, um, so, so yeah, there's no countdown for the test. Uh, so um, basically, the test, what it will look like is I'm going to post a file with a test, test on it. It will look like what test one looked like, the one that you took in class. And you don't have to print it out. Um, you, do, you can just look at the test and you're going to write your answers by hand on a piece of paper. Or you can type it if, if that's more convenient to you. Uh, but it will look like a regular test, not like a test that you take on an online format like my math lab or anything like that. So you'll write out all, all the answers and when you're done with it, you're gonna take pictures or scan it and upload it to Canvas. So there's no countdown. It's basically, I will release it at noon on Thursday and you need to submit it by noon on Friday. So it won't run out, it won't close. But if you submit it afternoon on Friday, then I might not take it. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah, Andy, I I don't think so. Not nothing that I've heard of that anybody got sick in Miramar. Uh, but that I don't think that information will be given to people. Uh, that's sort of that's it's kind of private. Right. <laughs> yeah, I haven't. I don't. I don't really know uh, about people getting sick or not. I like whoever gets sick. I hope they they get better. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's my wish. All right. I'll stop recording now because I don't think we need to record this.